In 1896, in a dusty field outside of a town called Adwa in northeast Ethiopia, an army of Europeans armed with bolt-action rifles and breech-loading artillery was utterly crushed by an army of almost 100,000 Ethiopians armed with the exact same equipment that those Italians brought to bear. You may have heard of this war, the first Italo-Ethiopian War, and most people chalk it up to Italian incompetence rather than Ethiopian success. But I want to look at this self-strengthening movement because what you may not know is only 30 years before this failed Italian expedition, there was a successful British one. The Brits managed to go deep into Ethiopia, making local allies, and they arrived at the Emperor's camp, burning it to the ground and stealing the relics of Ethiopian history, which still sit in the British Museum to this day. That Emperor, Teodros II, would die by his own hand, using a revolver ironically gifted to him by Queen Victoria. So how is it that within the span of 30 years, Ethiopia went from a nation that was disunified and dying in the face of European aggression, to a nation which could form a powerful modern army that could rival anything the Europeans could throw at them. It's a bit of a strange story. It starts with a Swiss engineer, a regional king, and a heist to get machine tools deep into the countryside of Ethiopia to build a bullet factory. Hi all. I'm not an Italian Ascari, and this is Ground Up History. But before I get into this epic heist story, I wanted to start with some context around Ethiopian history. So, for most of Ethiopian history, it's been ruled by a group known as the Solomonid Dynasty. The belief behind it is that King Solomon of the Bible traveled down the Red Sea and married the Queen of Sheba, a Yemeni kingdom. And their offspring would go on to be the emperors of Ethiopia, at the time known as Aksum. Their offspring would then found a dynasty that would be so important to the Ethiopian political system that for anybody to become the Negus Nugate, the King of Kings of Ethiopia, they would have to have this legacy of Solomonid blood. And see, within the political system of the Ethiopian Empire, there was something kind of akin to feudalism, but more like ancient Persia, where you had the Shah and Shah, the King of Kings. Ethiopia had something called the Negus Nagate, uh, also meaning King of Kings. And the Negus was a hereditary position of regional kings who would rule over the various sub-kingdoms of Ethiopia. What's important here is that that was a hereditary position, which quite often had to have some lineage to the Solomonid dynasty or some other important family. But there's also a term you might see thrown around a lot called the Ross. And Ross is sort of a complicated term. It's used for a lot of different positions of power because it wasn't hereditary. So someone might basically just have the power of like a duke, and someone could also be a king and both be called a Ross. The important distinction being that neither one of them had a hereditary right to that position and was only granted it by the emperor. And also, in the economic system of Ethiopia, if you were a Negus, you would actually have right to the land and all of its labor in a very feudal sort of system of economics. But if you were only a Ross, those peasants would actually be in direct service to the Negus Nogate. So in certain regions where there were like vitally important exports, they would intentionally not be granted the title of Negus and instead Ross, simply because it was better for the emperor to have control of those peasants directly. And in some cases, it was actually also better for the peasants. So it's not really a feudal economy as we would think of it in the context of Europe. It's more of a feudal political system. So what had happened was that in the early 1700s, there was a falling of power within Ethiopia. The Solomon dynasty still existed, but there was no one force which could declare itself the emperor. This led to a period of de facto civil war known as the Zamana Mesafent, essentially translating to the rule of princes or the rule of judges, depending on how you want to translate it. What happened during this period was a chaotic set of rivals all vying for power between each other and deeply dividing rivalries, in particular along ethnic and religious lines. The Amhara and Tigrayans divided amongst the Christian populations of Ethiopia, and the Oromo Muslims further alienated from that system of power. Over the course of the Zamana Mesafent, a certain political tactic would become incredibly ingrained, known as shifta politics. Shifta essentially meaning nuisance, 
Uh, basically, it was a style of political banditry. You would functionally annoy the power in your region by being enough of a guerrilla warlord that they simply couldn't stop you in return for certain noble privileges. This would be a method that would lead to many people gaining power and would become so normalized within Ethiopia that many wouldn't see what was about to happen with the British. See, Teodros II functionally ended, although not completely, the Zamana Mesafent when he declared himself the Emperor of Ethiopia, gaining just enough power to finally unify some of the country. But nobody would recognize him internationally. The British, who were becoming present in the region, refused to acknowledge him as a statesman, which infuriated him. Within the context of Shifta, he made a decision that would prove fatal. He kidnapped a British delegation and their missionaries, essentially thinking that if he simply held them captive and demanded ransom in the form of acknowledgments from Queen Victoria, the British would happily oblige give him the recognition he wanted, and open trade, perhaps. Instead, what Britain did was what Britain always does. They sent an army, crushed him, and he died. But even within that context, the next emperor who would rise, Johannes IV, was still rewarded for shift of politics. See, Johannes was a small regional warlord. He was of no importance, but managed to be enough of a problem for Teodros while he still ruled, that he managed to gain certain noble privileges. And then, when the British invaded, he immediately betrayed Teodros and sided with the British, who in exchange gave him guns. This gave him enough power to become the next emperor, but while he was given good guns by the British, he was not given enough bullets. The trade of ammunition into Ethiopia was heavily restricted by Europeans, which is going to be very important to our story later. So while Teodros was able to gain power and begin a process of centralization, which Teodros mostly failed to achieve, he also would fall, mostly this time on his own internal divisions and the alienation of Christians and Muslims within Ethiopia. See, over the course of his rule, the Egyptian Kebdivit would invade Ethiopia with American advisors and modern weaponry, and he declared what was essentially a crusade against Egypt to stop them, which did work but deeply alienated the Oromo Muslims within his country, some of whom were some of the most important, particularly cavalry, in Ethiopia. This alienation would only worsen when he eventually went to war with the Mahdists of Sudan, a fascinating cult of Muslims <laughs> out of Khartoum. That's a whole other story. But those Mahdists would put Johannes IV's head on a pike. So now we have two emperors dying for failures of foreign policy. And our next contender to the throne is going to find that his skill in that field would prove decisive. So at this point, we have two dead emperors and a still deeply divided country. So who would be this third and ultimately most successful emperor of Ethiopia? A man by the name of Menelik II. Menelik II had kind of like a wild childhood. See, when he was originally born into the region of Shoa, he was the rightful next king, but in fact his father was deposed when Teodros II became the emperor, and Menelik in fact ended up being in the court of Teodros as a kidnapped child. His father was replaced by a man loyal to Teodros, who would be named Ross, since that man actually didn't have any right to the hereditary title of Negus. And there's some potential that Teodros had planned to actually raise Menelik to be a sort of loyal subject in Shoa, and then finally grant him the title of Negus, because ultimately the Ross that he would put in place in Shoa would kind of undermine Teodros' power anyway, like he didn't support him when the British invaded. So. Menelik II would actually end up being kind of a comeback rightful prince story. He came to Shoa, made local allies, and they overthrew that Ross, and then restored the title of Negus for Menelik against the interests of the emperor. And while this story would prove vital to sort of Menelik's position amongst the Amhara, it would also kind of alienate a lot of Tigrayans. So, Early in his rule, he was kind of a very divisive figure. He was seen as someone who sort of took power for himself, and there were a lot of accusations that, say, for example, during the reign of Johannes IV, he had planned to support the Egyptians, which kind of alienated him from some of the Christians, and his army didn't exactly arrive to support Johannes' army. 
He might have even wanted to support the British, we don't really know. But what we do know is that Menelik made a life for himself through intrigue, all his life, and this would ultimately prove vital in his dealings with Europe. Menelik II would rise to power and become the Emperor of Ethiopia, and he would first begin by bridging some of the internal divides which had undermined his allies. He would make friends with certain Oromo leaders, namely Ross McHale, who would provide vital Oromo cavalry to his armies, and he would marry a Tigrayan woman by the name of Taitu Betul with local noble connections in that region, helping to bridge the gap between Tigray and Amhara. But he still had a problem. See, the Europeans did not particularly want to acknowledge Ethiopia's existence in case they wanted to colonize it. East Africa had become a hotbed for tensions. France and Britain almost started a war over Sudan. They really wanted to control the Red Sea, and Italy was desperately ambitious for a bigger empire. So Menelik found himself in a delicate position. He would manage to make some deals, like banning the slave trade, he normalized relations to an extent with the British. He would bring in French advisors for his military, and he would get some acknowledgements from the Italians, although limitedly so. His biggest early ally would actually be the Russians, who he sent delegations to saying, hey, we're also Orthodox Christian, shouldn't you defend us? And to their credit, the Russian Tsar did send some weapons and advisors to Ethiopia. But his most important European ally would prove to be one he made long before he became the emperor. While he was still just the Negus of Shoah, Menelik would go on to hire a man by the name of Alfred Ilg, a Swiss engineer, his being Swiss was important since he didn't want to hire a colonial official. And he had hired Ilg originally to just develop the country. He wanted a sort of infrastructure project and thought that he would be a useful advisor. But Ilg would prove to be more ambitious than a simple engineer. He ended up becoming an important figure of state within Ethiopia. And he would ultimately pull off the plot that would lead to Ethiopia having finally a means of bullet production. While Menelik was emperor and making all these various deals with Europeans, he always had the same problem. They would give him guns, but never enough bullets, especially if he wanted to actually be able to train his men how to use them. His most famous deal that he signed was with the Italians, the Treaty of Wuchale, an unequal treaty which, due to contentiously a translation error, claimed that Ethiopia was now a protectorate of Italy although in the Amharan documents it's contested whether or not it actually says so. Menelik had signed this treaty because he believed that it was a guarantee of his independence from the Italians, and it also came with the stipulation that Italy would send him thousands, tens of thousands of Carcano rifles, the same rifles that the Italians were arming their own army with. But the Italians only sent him enough bullets so that his men could fire off maybe twice at most? So the Italians were under the belief that they had just essentially peacefully gained control of the whole region, they could slowly annex it at their own will, and they had just armed the locals in a way that was fairly normal for the Europeans. A significant portion of the Italian army in Eritrea was Ascari, local men armed and equipped by the Italians. So providing the Ethiopians with rifles wasn't as much of a concern, especially if they didn't have the bullets to really fight back. And this is where Alfred Ilg would prove vital. See, Ilg hatched a scheme. When he originally came to Ethiopia, he had to travel by boat to the Red Sea, get off at a port controlled by the British, and then go through their border checks. When that finally cleared, he was able to hire a chic caravan which had to carry him for weeks on camelback into the highlands of Ethiopia. So there wasn't really going to be an option to ship heavy equipment into the country. But he would devise a scheme where when he went back to Switzerland, he would prepare a small machine capable of producing coins, but with the intention of being reminted to produce bullets. When he completed that retooling back in Addis, that's when the fun began. But first he had to get through British border control, which is why he had to originally make the machine capable of actually stamping real coins. So he goes through the rigmarole of getting back to the Red Sea, gets out at the British port, and they pull him aside and they find this machine and there are intense controls on the ability to get machine tools into any African country at this point since Europe wants to be able to have total supremacy. Alfred Ilg convinces them though that 
This is a simple machine for minting coins. It doesn't really have any ability to industrialize the nation, and he's simply an infrastructure advisor. So what's the harm? He minted a few coins in front of them, proving his story, and knowing that he was, in fact, an engineer advisor to the now emperor of Ethiopia, they did let him through. And Ilg would then be able to load his small machine onto the caravan, and those camels would be able to carry it through the highlands into Addis. He would then quickly retool that machine and begin pumping out bullets. The workshop he set up would allow Ethiopia to build up a munitions arsenal. This would allow them to train their army. The famous Mehel Safari, the kind of imperial guard, would get training from the best French advisors money could hire. And his regular forces would become equipped and trained with rifles as well. So now, Menelik was in a position where he had managed to carefully navigate the diplomatic difficulties of the European ambitions. He had unified a deeply divided internal state, and he had solved the most important problem which plagued his country's ability to strengthen its army, the ability to make their own bullets. So with Ilg having pulled off his bullet manufacturing scheme, and Menelik having managed to unify the interior and also gain European advisors, he now had the arsenal to train his army. He could probably have armed 70,000 men with mostly modern rifles, bolt-action rifles, the same ones the Italians would be using. And when the Treaty of Uccale was finally declared broken by the Italians, because Menelik had the gall to contact Europeans not through Italian diplomatic channels, what you need to understand is that this was not a hilarious failure of the Italian military, but a remarkable defeat of a European power. The Italian army that went into Ethiopia was strong. One of the largest expeditions that Europeans had launched into Africa. The Italian army was nearly 20,000 men armed with rifles and breech-loading artillery. They were well prepared and well trained. To put that into perspective as well, at El Sandalwan, the other major European disaster of this period against Africans, there were less than 2,000 Brits present at the battle. So. The Italians were no slouches, they were going in with a major force. And what they met was an army they could not have been prepared for. Put yourself into the shoes of one of these Italian soldiers. You're marching into Ethiopia, and you know they have rifles, but they've been fighting a lot of regional wars to solidify their borders. By all counts, they shouldn't have any bullets left, and if they do, they can maybe fire a couple volleys. You're expecting to be fighting men with spears and swords. So as you're marching in and your scouts tell you there are tens of thousands of Ethiopians surging towards your positions, you're still probably confident. I mean, in this period, the belief was you were superior in every way to this foe. And the Italians had a credible plan. They took three hills with the goal being to have interlocking rates of fire so they could support each other. This was exactly what the British had done to destroy the earlier Ethiopian army they had fought 30 years ago. But the Italians had outdated maps, and ultimately the hills they would take were isolated from each other and couldn't provide the support they needed. And also the plan of taking hills would prove disastrous, because while they were expecting to have their enemy try to charge uphill at them with spears, instead their enemy would just relentlessly fire into them with bullets and artillery. So again, Imagine you're that Italian. You're now on a dusty, isolated hill, and instead of an enemy of spearmen charging up this rusty hill towards you, you are instead being laid into with fire. Men are dying all around you. And not only that, Oromo cavalry managed to circle these hills, cut off the roads, and then hopped off their horses and began sniping the officers. So the commander is dead, there's no escape, you're surrounded, and the enemy fire just does not stop. Over 200 Italian officers likely died in this battle. And of the men who were fighting, probably over half to maybe three quarters would be killed, wounded, or captured by final end of day. That is a brutal defeat, but it's also important to note these Italians fought hard. This was not a simple rollover 
the Ethiopians would also suffer a similar level of casualty, although as a percentage of their army it was significantly smaller, probably three to 7,000 Ethiopian dead. Thousands of Italians were captured in this fight. And those would be men who would go on to actually build roads in Ethiopia. There's kind of a interesting dynamic of power there, where in many other countries the captives of war would be the black Africans, and here it was quite the opposite. Those men would be advocated for by the Pope himself, and released as a sign of grace by Menelik. And ultimately, you may wonder, okay, so if Menelik crushed an army this big, so decisively, why didn't they go on to retake Eritrea? And yeah, it's an easy question to ask. Many people of his own times did. But I think he made the right choice. See, Eritrea was to Graham ethnically and been alienated from his empire for quite a while. By reclaiming that territory, he would strengthen to Graham rivals of his, one of the most important being a man by the name of Ras Alula, who had been one of the most important generals during the days of Johannes IV, and had been a war hero who had fought border clashes against the Italians for years before Menelik rose to power. Not only did it help him strengthen his own internal position, it also allowed him to present himself as a victim of violence, but a merciful and peaceable man in international affairs. By not following the Italians into Eritrea and ultimately releasing the captives he took, he was able to normalize relations with the French and the British, which would prove vital. They would sign treaties and ultimately build the Addis Djibouti Railway, which would massively increase export trade for Ethiopia. He would build telegraph lines, and on that railroad, now there would be a flow of diplomats, industrialists, and new advisors that would come into this new modern city. And this is where Ethiopia really becomes a symbol of Africa and African modernization. This is kind of why I want to tell this story, because so often when I see people talk about Ethiopia, they only really think about it in the context of the wars with Italy, and only really as an opportunity to mock the Italians, while ignoring the incredible story of modernization and self-strengthening which allowed Ethiopia to become a nation recognized on the world stage and inducted into the League of Nations during a period in which African peoples were considered functionally subhuman. Ethiopia as a nation would become vitally symbolic to so many anti-colonial and liberation movements around the world. It happened in part because of something as simple as a small toolbox that could mint coins traveling by camelback into the highlands. I think that's kind of an amazing story, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. I know that there was a lot of information here. This was very stream of information for me. If you couldn't tell, this was a big point of study for me when I was back in university. So sorry if this was a little all over the place. But if you want to know more about Ethiopian history, I would love to oblige. And of course, please like, subscribe, and comment below. And let me know if this sort of more informal and more modern history is also of interest to you to the other stuff I've done. Thanks.